husband's mother for the first time. This is called A New Friend. He took me there to meet his mother. The farmhouse hugged the brim of the hill. Nerve wracking, really, whether I would be accepted. The first afternoon I slipped away, found a place that seemed right to me, lay down in the high grass. The ground was hard at first, but my spine adjusted, a few times inching up and back until I noticed a settling in of sorts and a shifting in my head of the far off hills I saw before I stretched out as they dipped out of sight. The night before, I heard the frogs on the way up the road, peepers they call them, how they stopped when we approached, and then one would start up again, and after several minutes, another one would answer until the whole pondful got going again, a peeper's symphonic poem gathering velocity. The last morning, after we cleared the breakfast dishes away, she and I found ourselves sitting together in the dining room, and she wanted to know if I had read Dana's two years before the mast, which I hadn't. And it was so vivid for her, how they brought skins down to the beach to dry before they would be loaded onto the ships on 19th century California beaches, the intricacy of the detail. I thought then we might be friends and she smiled, said she had noticed me lying out there in the grass like it was the proper thing to do and I had done it and there was so little time. By next summer, she would be gone. So um, I grew up in Southern California uh, in suburban Los Angeles. And uh, it was a quiet time in the 50s. A vision I saw on a street in New York City a few years ago actually took me back to my childhood in a strange way. <clears throat> this is called In the Bowery. Mix masters sprawled onto the sidewalk in front of the restaurant supply store, metal beater blades turned upward like supplicants, banded ropes of electrical wire, La Signora stove pop espresso pots. One could be in Italy, Prato, down the street from the Madonna of the Sacred Girdle. But we pushed on to the photography center where video artists had left us endless loops washing machines caught in the phrased, crazed frenzy of unbridled spin, their belts whipping, a dance my brother couldn't have known, but invented just the same at age seven with four glass milk bottles placed reverently in our washer, not even bothering to select a cycle, producing a racket so pervasive the neighbors heard it two blocks away. And my mother had to pay Henry Hatta the only one brave enough to pull the plug. As children, strange visions came to us, like those of the holy relics, our mother seen once struggling to throw her girdle to the floor. So um, the first soldier I knew who went to Vietnam was my neighbor across the street, and uh, I was still in high school. This is called Carob Trees. <clears throat> I didn't know the pods were edible, but I hunted and gathered them anyway on the sidewalk in front of my house, mostly quiet afternoons except for intermittent thuds, usually three in a row, and then a swish, our neighbor John practicing his art of baskets, attacking from all sides, each time placing the ball in the hoop. His older brother Mike had disappeared for a while to a place we knew nothing of, but had read about in our weekly readers, a bifurcated nation somewhere in Asia where people had been promised elections, just like in the good old USA. Our soldiers were putting out fires, we were told. It was on television, the long flowing robes of those incandescent monks. When Mike came home, he was nowhere to be found. His brother still sh sank his shots and we helped our mother sweep up the carob pods that overran the walk. Mike was home, but not home. And so we asked his mother, Judy, where was Mike? He was the only soldier we had known. When would he tell us what he'd done? 
He spends long days in his room, she said. So um, by the time I was in college, it was the late 60s. And uh, this is great that my nephew is, on, is listening because um, <laughs> he gave me the title for this poem. It's a prose poem. It's called, My Nephew Says I Have a Sharp Eye. My nephew's not really in this poem at all. He just gave me the title. <laughs> <clears throat> it was in the last Episcopal church I visited that I saw it next to the reverend's throne where he sits when not speaking, a bottle of hand sanitizer on a white doily. And I wondered if it were a protection against blasphemy, a weapon for purification, or even a new requirement before offering the host, immediately conjuring an image of the priest in hairnet and plastic gloves. And I thought back to an earlier communion in my college church, where we had been shown a documentary about the American bombing of Hanoi. And afterwards, we ascended the stairs and partook of the sacrament. We touched each other and our food. We broke off pieces of sourdough bread and passed around a cup of Dago red San Francisco wine, imagined how we would demonstrate in the streets, spread a message of purity, true cleanliness turning out to be no easy solution manufactured for a plastic bottle. And it sounds like I wrote that last week, but <laughs> it was it's in my book and it's from a few years ago. So things never change. Um, we, I speak, speak of we, meaning our generation, we of course had the best music. And uh, you may not know this, but Georg Friedrich Handel lived in London in a flat which several centuries later was next door to one occupied by Jimi Hendrix. And there's a museum there now. So I imagined them somehow living there at the same time. This is called Handel and Hendrix in two adjacent flats. Collapse the centuries, Georg Friedrich moves in, finds Jimmy next door. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, up against purple haze, excuse me while I kiss the sky. Handel hires soprano Kitty Clive, a voice to crack the Messiah, and Hendrix loved a wind, a girl called Mary. Foxy lady, you look so good. Handel kept calling Kitty back, though she was a handful. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, cry unto her, resonating with not necessarily stoned, but beautiful. Jimmy clipped a curl from Mary, stowed it in his boot, maintained their connection voodoo style. Handel's wig was full-bottomed, a fugue in itself, unraveling like the voice of Clive. They asked Jimmy, are you experienced? He learned about his neighbor, played Handel riffs, bought vinyl water music, heard the rivulets in his repeated lines, hey Joe, I'm going down. And down he went one night, too much, too much Vesperax. Handel died blind at home, his mate next door, comatose. So um, every, every guy I knew was trying to figure out what to do about the draft, whether to run or hide. One casualty was a friend I studied with in Italy in 1967. This is called um, Lake Trasimeno, 1967 for Don. My idea in Assisi had been to inspect the frescoes, Francis handing his clothes to the poor. Sign me up for the contemplative life. Not so fast, you said, having made arrangements for us to be agents of good shifting books in a junk shop in town, the owner pleased. Hitchhiking back to Florence was less straightforward and for hours we stalled on the road beside the lake, the very one where all those Romans fell, their leader, Flaminius, impetuous, lacking in self-control. Your father's plan involved the army, something I didn't know at the time. Hannibal's men, hid in the shallow water, using hollowed reeds to breathe, and surprised the Romans, who saw nothing in the fog, the sound of their trumpets lost, 
15,000 of them killed in battle or drowned. For our country, not all the losses were in Vietnam. They say you dreaded being shipped out, snatched relief from pharmacology, heard trumpets in your head, then ended your life. Livy tells us how when the mist cleared off, the mm. bodies were revealed, the ambush was complete. Little carrot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then go to um, test speakers. Micro oh, we did that already. Go to audio settings. I just lost her. Let okay, me. then go back. To did. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Doran. Yeah. Doran, you're live. I can hear you now. Oh, oh you can hear me. Good. I hit the right button then. <laughs> I missed the last couple minutes figuring that out. So are we just segueing into my reading right now? No, no, no. Uh, we're oh, I uh, interrupt Sharon's reading. Yeah, we're with uh, Sharon right now. Okay. All right. All right. No so, worries. Okay. Great. Now I can't hear you. Um, Sharon, you can unmute. Hear Bob. Okay. Can you hear now me? Now? Hear you. Yeah. Okay. So we've gone from <clears throat> Italy uh, these days. Almost every day we're looking at the photo of the enemy, a virus that twirls around in front of us, the same photo, the only photo. This is called Just Look, Don't Touch. Why does the enemy look so festive, a spherical ball with red pom poms staring at us from the news summary? our message devices, the science hour. Surely it's not Christmas yet, the season of red ornaments twirling as one br brushes past the tree, ruddy faces smiling as we brave the snowy cold. They say the protrusions allow the thing to grab onto us, our cells, the lining of our lungs. Think of the way the jacks in our palm tingled. No, not like that. I wonder if the image is copyrighted, if someone gets the credit, makes a million, puts down their camera, swears never to use it again. So um, the days start to run together, don't they, <clears throat> these days? This is called Poemless Monday. On a day with no poems, decisions populate the screen. Aging in place versus living abroad, how the weeks have sped by, Confusing for us which day is for garbage alone, rolling out those lonely blue carts, leaving the recycling aside. How many days left to us as we check off indecipherable calendar entries, hoping to make legible our names on the urine sample jar, studying the reference range for pH and specific gravity. At some point we ask ourselves just who is going to read the poems we've hidden in our Emily Dickinson drawers? And what is an executor? Who dictates to the secretary, our druthers, our inheritance, and what will survive, shorthand or scribbles? On the other planets, the ones we think are inhabited, what decisions are made there by those faint figures, their habits unknowable? What is daily, they might ask? What is ongoing? What are poems? <clears throat> this poem is in Obad, and it might help if you've seen the movie The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie, but hopefully that's not necessary. Obad. Sometimes the journey is arduous, but the effort is left out of the narration, which is why we are slammed with a vision of three heat-stifled French couples wiping their brows staggering on the road again and again in Boonwell's film. He wants us to understand the actors, even the real people, don't always arrive easily at their destination. I remember large stones in the road as a path wound up and around. Intermittent signs said to keep going, the car having let us out on the highway so long ago it was now late afternoon. Shadows hiding the rocks we stumbled upon, obscuring view of the plateau we were aiming for. 
where we arrived in the dark, Auberge de Jeunesse, the youth hostel of Cassis. And now we are truly seeking youth, but not finding it. Slight resurgences occur and then fade, as if Bunuel is making a film of our lives, leaving in all the bits we wished we could leave behind, the embarrassments, the slights, the prevarications, and we carry them along with everything else, wondering if youth was the only time we looked ahead with curiosity, reassuring ourselves the darkness would lift when morning came. There's so much to be angry about, injustice, oppression, the fate of the earth. This is what I heard upon waking. I thought I heard the earth groan as if it couldn't go on much longer, as trucks far off on the highway sang from the weight they bore, driven to make one last run before morning. As if children had been lined up to sing, woken up in the middle of the night but wouldn't perform, and whined instead, a chorus in unison, transfixed by the baton that tried to lead them frozen in the upswing, startled by the view. It only takes a few drops of water on the rim and one finger on the edge of the glass to begin a slow circling. We think we hear a heavenly sound as the gods play with us, no stopping for breath, all of us wishing our planet will carry on. So I thought I'd read just two more poems. And um, one of them will tell you about the world here in Jersey, which is a little different than California. This poem is called Reassurances. <clears throat> Northeast of Newark at the Alexander Hamilton service area, the baby changing station hugs the wall next to the Sharps depository. Yellow legs stand in the mud flats of Hackensack. The drawbridge, weighted on one side with blocks of concrete, waits for the tipping point. Nearby, in the supermarket, a sign reminds the customers, do not bring shopping carts into the bathroom with you. They will be safe outside the door. Shylock's daughter, Jessica, could be there, roaming the produce aisles. All the ducats gone, and the baby due, hand on her stomach, eyeing the melons. Walt Whitman's ghost journeys down the turnpike, finds Gomel Chesed Cemetery and the Ginsburg section, sits beside his friend Alan, lately of the supermarket. The long refrigerator trucks idle just outside the cemetery fence. The Latino groundskeeper keeps his beer cold between two upright slabs. At the mortuary office in the adjacent Catholic cemetery, the secretary has never heard of Ginsburg, but exhibits a slight galvanic response to the word howl. The woman steering the shopping cart into the neighborhood market has everything arranged just so, doesn't want anything touched, even the pile of plastic bags. Whitman tells her not to worry. Lorca puts in an appearance near the peppers. She parks the cart outside the bathroom door. Oh, my ducats, my daughter. And um, I'll end with a poem that I call Meditation in Rome. Let's bring it to here. Mm. Meditation in Rome. The gaze from Sant'Estacchio il Caffè reveals a stag atop the nearby church, a crucifix sprouting between its antlers. Stirring my cappuccino, I think of Ubertus, as Eustace is called in Belgium, the hunter who saw his vision of the crucifix in the forest of the Ardennes and asked his would-be victim what he might do. The stag counseled good hunting, trimming the ranks of the herd. I think of the X's spray painted onto the carcasses of fallen deer 
in my neighborhood, marked for hauling away. Fallen, perhaps overused as a euphemism for dead soldiers, as if they had merely stumbled, breaking rank in procession towards the enemy at Waterloo, Quezon, Candus. In my America, gun cases beckon. Designer bags hold personal revolvers. Video games tally the number killed for the game player with his joystick, the one who flunked anger, anger management and blamed the schoolmates who mocked and bullied him, who now focuses his aim on the heads of children in the crosshairs. Inside the church lie the bones of Sant'Eustachio, painted onto the dome above the wings of the Holy Spirit flung wide. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really fun reading to you guys. Thank <laughs> you, Sharon. Right. <laughs> you see? Yeah. Should I mute myself? <laughs> That was great. Thank you so much. Uh, do you have uh, any uh, other upcoming readings uh, in the coming uh, days or weeks? Or months? Uh, no, I I actually gave a reading in uh, virtually in New Hampshire a couple months ago, and uh, for an organization I belong to up there called the uh, Scriven Art Colony, I think it's called. <clears throat> but that's the only thing I've done recently. And uh, any books in the works coming up? Uh, well, it seems like you, uh, you know, the, the time in between my books is usually about right. So <laughs> there was like 2006 and then this is last year. So, you know, this is last year, my book, and I don't know if I'll be having a new book that soon, but who knows? Sometimes you gotta hurry up when the, getting at my age. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, Sharon. Shall I mute myself? Um, sure, that's okay. Unless uh, it's quiet there, you can just hang out with the mic on. That's okay. Um, I'll be quiet. But go ahead uh, if you want. Uh, you can mute yourself. And uh, now we'll uh, move to uh, to Doran. Um, uh, Doran. Um, just say test, test for us or something, just to make sure. Can you hear me? Great. Yes, okay. loud and clear. Thanks, Dorn. Dorn uh, is a poet, a mixed media artist, literary critic, composer of poetic prose monologues, and his work has appeared in a great many publications, 5 a.m., Kayak, if we all remember Kayak, Exquisite Corpse, uh, you know, all the great mags uh, that we love to read and uh, his book Twin Extra, a poem in three parts, Wild Ocean Press 2015 was nominated for the National Jewish Book Council Award in Poetry and in 2020, Stephen uh, Duville Press published his monograph Apocalypse Contemporary on Sharon Dubadio's book Naked to the Earth and Hi Moon Noon books published Not Fade Away, Poetic Prose Monologues, Three Sequences. Dorn is Emeritus Professor of Creative Writing and Literature at Foothill College. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight and your patience in uh, troubleshooting here. Uh, Dorn, uh, go ahead. Um, let me uh, get you spotlighted here. Okay. Excellent. All right. So I'm going to read from my new book not fade away <clears throat> and uh, just came out and it's three uh, longer uh, poetic prose monologues. They're kind of like hybrids of uh, prose poetry and poetry. Um, the uh, title itself though, I mean, obviously some of us are familiar with the, you know, the Buddy Holly song, Not Fade Away. And although that, was on my mind. The title was inspired actually by um, Shamas Haney's translation or bringing into modern English uh, an old Irish poem from, in the, from the Middle Ages called Sweeney Astray. And it, uh, the epitaph comes from a section in 
that poem where the anonymous narrator says, you crowd my head and fade away and leave me to the night. And the thing that struck me about that passage was, um, well, how we all are facing that, that night when we're just left alone with our own solitude and our meditations about the world, about what's going on, about our dream life, and uh, about death. Um, so I, I, it also kind of humbled me that this was written like in the 14th century, which was then even a translation of something that was written in the 12th century. And that this um, continuity of um, poetic accountability um, is such an old tradition to belong to and um, to always find remarkable. So I'm going to begin. Um, I've been reading a lot from the book one, um, which is from a separate text called Recordation. Each of the chapters is from a separate text. So I'm going to be reading from the second two chapters. And the second chapter is Apologization. And it, it, it has a conceit that runs through it. You know, the conceit being that I'm kind of mockingly asking for forgiveness for something that is kind of uh, contradictory in itself. I'm really not asking for forgiveness. It's kind of just like an interjection, you know, to continue with the narration. Um, since they don't have titles other than the chapters that begin them, I'll just give a kind of a lead word or a character that runs through it. So for example, in this one, this was once a poem that was uh, dedicated to uh, Mozart, and he appears through this poem in a kind of a dreamlike fantasy. Forgive me, not even your Mozart, your usual Mozart, your repetitive Mozart, excuse me, variation is constant. Mozart's musical math doesn't change the perspective. Mozart's arithmetic is a kind of knitting, a dirge, a sound pearl, the assembly of an interior helmet. Obviously, it is beyond my logic. Therefore, I have never, and neither should anyone else, start out when his fantasia begins leaking its way down the stairs ahead of you. Try swishing that music around with your foot when you reach the water. You can't do it. You can't swim out that far. You can't go back to the world. It is never receptive to someone who hears Mozart in his head, a person with his own tick, a person reassembled through Mozart, and just the sort of person to persist singing at the wall, shaving with Mozart drooling, the way you remember him, cutting his absent-minded Mozart's cheek, letting Mozart bleed for distracting you, that bastard, sucked in by his half-grown coffin, gargling his fantasia, cinnamon, something brand mouthwash, daubing pieces of Kleenex to the cut open skin. There's weight, the pressure, his exquisite notes, my anti-rhythms, his terrifying stutter, his precision with a royal whip held over him. The abrupt threatening passages, the flying by numbers, the old math of euphoria, comparable numbers for melancholia, to assure yourself, to get through the waking phase, to prepare you, don't know what till you get there, his calculations, you were meant to hear them measured, you were meant to recount Mozart in your head, keeping him there, assuring you it's the natural course, Mozart eating the last of your apple strusel, your herring, brick after brick of packaged freeze-dried coffee, he was counting something in his head, listening along with you to the same Mozart, recording, pleased with Mozart's rhythms. A pitcher of black tea later, you're watering the red sage, Mozart is out of it. Forgive him, he's reading the toothpaste box for microwave instructions, thinking of microheat, thinking of alternate sound. He had a face like a three-foot sore, perplexed lethargy, Lethargic perplexity, headbanger in my head to Mozart of all the fantasias, of all the heads to be inside a head, of all the sounds to extend my hearing as far as the pressure points, 
in my left pinky. Why does the mind create an involuntary trickster like Mozart? The minuetto part of the recording determined the mood. The pattering in the wall determined the mood. I didn't know what I was standing in, propelled down the slope, the unfamiliar stairs again. The ceiling was lower. No, I was walking upward. I wasn't walking on a standard floor. I don't think there was a rectangular param parameter foundation, wall supporting girders, bolted stud plates. Forget about it. Excuse me. The wood surfaces were all rotten, including membranes under the sunken threshold. It personified something, an interior fate. It was a kind of retrieval, my positivism. I didn't expect this Mozart. How does the unforeseeable become inevitable? You wonder if the inevitable really was unforeseen. I was preparing. You foresee mistakes. Sometimes they outwit you. Don't get cocky. It isn't meant to be the final version. Of course it is. And so forth. I felt defiant from the start. Defiance. The unforeseen. What am I saying? Mostly I was awake in a void and not the last time. I lived in a kind of undertow, an undertow. An undertow of what? It's all an undertow. It's just an undertow. So as the monologue proceeds, like uh, characters uh, come into it that I address or that address me, and this is a uh, passage uh, on the hero. In another intrusion, it's said in the book on the hero, when you reach the red salvia, Mitahorsa, you'll find a cardinal honeybee tapping a blossom off the stem. Pick up the phantom limb. To reach it, you'll have to go through a roll of chicken wire 40 feet thick. Make that 53 feet. It'll seem like 500 lineal feet of wire by the time you get through. You'll know when you've come to the end of it, when a boy and his constipated goat approach you for money, give him the sage petals to heal the animal. If the goat doesn't, as we say, do his business within five minutes, turn back immediately. If the goat, as we also confide, starts crapping and the restless tongue syndrome begins, and you look up seeing silver coloration shoot out in flashes, darkening in turns, if you see the tail spouts flicker from swarms of minnows overflowing the river rocks, if one minnow raises its silver petaled waist to elaborate, if you see plunging on the fish school of shadows, plunging on the part unemptied inside part, turn around. Roll back the corrugated metal door you thought was okay to pass. Exit to the street. When you leave, you displace an amount equal to your volume, including, forgive me, the ardent seed case below your other ardent thing. That's what it comes down to. I'm sorry for everything. No matter how much Jack you have left, you have read there used to be ceremonials for reversing journeys like these. I don't think so. You're going to go up the common street made of human teeth with the gold ripped out or worse. That street's been there in 213 likenesses. Look it up. People aren't being oppressed. They're being fossilized. Who can emphasize, empathize more when they can acknowledge it? Everything can't just be at your fingertips, hero. Forgive that, hero. Even when you're not lost, you're still off course. Some places, it's always night, always one chair. Whatever the dimensions of the garage, the attic, the studio, apartment. Some places you can't go two blocks. Dementia doll I was looking at. Talking drool. Slave labor, blue numbers, wrist tattoo. What does a mind still see that leaves a face still looking like that face? Something else that she was supposed to look like after, after. The complete meal after that, a completely covered table, always the complete. I gave two bucks of poker winnings to her at Oakland and Fairfax when two bucks was 5% of my winnings. The surf music station still going in my head, 
soup with pearl barley, lima, lima beans, stacked corned beef, mustard, Tabasco, maybe not Tabasco, maybe not always the hot, the only hot you can't take and don't want, even the pleasure of picking your teeth, even the pleasure of exile in mountain view, if that's the next view, maybe not mountain view. I don't like that mountain, but the pleasure, every island lily, every snapdragon branch, nautical moonberries, wild essentia seed, what they turn into, the complete redecomposition, always the complete. I'm a sluttish lunatic for the complete. It wasn't always too sublime either. Either enough, forget it. Back in the car, I don't feel like moving. The surf music station stuck on the dial when there was only a dial. I didn't care what I was listening to. The Bambi molesters this time, that name. Or is it the militarization of space? The history of low wages? Molesters in Palestine? Wounded knee next to the other wounded knee? The international Auschwitz numeration tattoo you parlor? Two-party dust syndrome? Economic bingo hoaxiology, loose nukes, civilian nukes, wounded eardrum, convenient middle passage routes, carcinogenic male genital shrinkage terror, wounded ghetto, the century to century 2200 year who's who quest for the final solution. Are those the names, those names, some of them? One of the competing repeatable lists under the Bambi molesters subheading, forgive me. Homer was the one, I don't know. Who does know? Some two-star psychoanalyst has a theory. Who and what I imagined Homer looked like cried beside me in a dream. Mr. Homer, my sidekick, choking and spitting out of his nose type of crying. Messed up the front of his toga. I think it was a toga. I was looking for a blanket to cover him, the master of crying. What a face he was making. I know that face anywhere. Don't ask me how I know those nostrils, that beard, that gurgled weeping, that Homer, Homero, Homier, both of us surging, my coming apart to his coming apart, weak in the groin. That's when I stop. That's when I start muttering wisecracks to myself. I retrieved my sanity that way. I figured it out. I don't remember any figuring it out process. You can't let the real or the unreal use its meat cutters on you any more than you can, any more than it would like to, already has to, especially the way it always used to. I used to welcome it right in. I won't dissimulate, excuse me, the sentencing is long, either sentence. You can't let it drain you. The landmine detector children again. The layoffs again. Another Psychology Today installment on coping with your mother's three faces again. You can't let it do you in. Continued unreported extinction, statistical handbook calculator, small town celebrated executions, chemical dumping, the other dumping, election theft junta normalcy, Hell with security gates. The world is a suburb of the Pentagon. First late night news feature on the victim's victim. The expose on Hebrew ketchup. Final archeological discussion on the first in Italian shoelace. The ungoing misjudged, mixed up, precalculated, uncompleted, revised version of Crapatolus Redundus. Homer, ever after. Odysseus and Penelope lived. The rest of Homer's characters lost everything. So did their slaves. So did the Bible's characters. So have the Sopranos cast. So will our farm workers, senators, janitors, missile designers, Dalai Lamas, and cooks. The absurdity of all bets, and every bet is on. The bet you live to lose. The Bambi molested lost bet, set bet of raw loss. Okay, I wish I had something shorter, man. I really took my breath away. <laughs> um, let's see. 
Um, this picks up with the undercurrent or the undertow that occurs at the end of the Mozart poem. Okay, say it is the undercurrent or the undertow. You come back from the undercurrent, one foot still in the undertow. And what kind of a person has a desire like that? There's nothing but unfittable pages, perplexed pages, all the pages until empty of pages. There's nothing but outside forces, optimism, insufficiently, impractically, the stasis of excess, the exhilaration of incompleteness, the misrule of chance, convinces, connivance or not. The worship of pages is endless. I need a new hat. Man, I need a different head. This time the hat with a harder brim to withstand the undercurrent and the forewarning of the less erratic currents, if they are currents, if that were someone in there other than him, what else would I inquire about? What else would be, would he remember or concede that hasn't already been unthreaded or stifled? The worship of sex is endless. Every matinee, I remember them. I read the permanent monogamous version again, the title to the song in my head, you, I think I would like to. Maybe it was a random phrase I mistook for a song. There was no melody. All the follow-up tunes have the same innuendo. The Pello book after 27 years, the Kama Sutra after middle age, the ongoing, unpredictably, irregularly. Say it's the undercurrent and say it doesn't always elevate and it does and it discontinues and refortifies and revertifies. The longer it all goes on, the more indeterminate, the less indefinite it is, predicting the face you look at in your head. It really is that vague. It really is that precise. Just a second, just a second. I saw my hair as a boy. The people around me spoke with assurance. The faces had definite affection. Agony has the kind of setup you can't recognize at five, to the degree you can at six, to the degree you will lift the agony binoculars to. We rode into the lake. I wanted the duck on my knee. Elation unnullified. From my bench, the hibiscus blossoms look so pale, watermelon red, they appeared like a formation of powder, almost blurry. A breeze increased the effect, the pallor matted in wrinkles. I could hear the rock band slave behave, which meant the opposite. There was no melody. There was something else. It was another dialect. There was a kind of breath. It came from the direction of the Tower of the Winds, Athens, 1977. Athens, 1987. Both Julys. It had sprawl. Twice there was no rim. The tempo kept rising, kept trailing off. It seemed from one of the cats picking over the food wrappings. Half of the copper sun left the columns. It coppered indefinite awareness. It made me shift. You get a craving. You get a pressure. Okay. Um, this one, um, I suppose if I were to title it, I would just call it the metal feeling. Um, but again, it, it, it flows in and, and has its kind of an indeterminate connection with the rest of the monologue in, in this sequence here. And again, it's part of the apologization, so it has you know, the, the conceit with the forgive me. Forgive me, right off, excuse all esoteric faults. You ever get the metal feeling? I heard a way out cardinal singing, putting down a signal. My whole torso was a metal shudder. You ever get the scorpion dream and the cardinal is in it and the cardinal can't get off the ground? The wings are something, the weight or something, the mental lifting, the chest armor pulling it down, the defective instinct or something. You're suffocating in a blue beak and the scorpion comes out for you, cardinal on the ground. We're made of that too. 
more the kind of cardinal that it's sane to be, the kind of cardinal who can't sing serenades inside a nest, the type that comes down to the ground to sing, and scorpions listen for that voice. That's the kind of music other than taps they listen for. Then they snap you. I had the middle feeling. Forgive me, the debt you get is the debt you need it to be. You add it up and take it out. You do it, you stop doing it, you do it again, you overdo it, you write it down, you forget to do it, you don't do it enough. You tally everything, you can't find anyone else to do it. You make up and thrust out your notes, cardinal on the ground. You put on metal, you don't know what you're wearing. You break what protects you, it's practical to you, your mixture, you're something to remember things by what things to remember with metal, without metal, the way you do the things you do. You ever get the wrong direction in the wrong place at the wrong time in the wrong city, at the wrong apartment in the wrong mindset in the only way possible and no way, no way around it because those were your cards, your outside forces, your aversion to forces, your habits, your mumbly peg, your 47 jobs labor myth. Forgive me, I'm talking about Tasmania. The sense for caution, the Tasmanian devil eating scorpions live, hunts for scorpions. Scorpions are their delicacy. Along the way, on the way out, there are delicacies. Those Tasmanians were my totem. What they ate, when they eat it, the delicacy you need to absorb until you're out of the wrong side, the wrong step, and the wrong Tasmania. What the hell was I doing in a Tasmania, wiping glass on the wrong side of the window? Birds, scorpions, devils that aren't monsters, the storm that waters language in the cracked parts of the body, your head a blur of repeated pages, and you get the metal feeling. You get depression's upside down wing as far as Tasmania, what it took for a while, what the rhythm gives back to you, what it's ready to unleash again, in case you think you can joke around when you come out of it. Okay, I'm gonna read one more. Is I have time for one more? Am I okay with one more? This is kind of a, uh, I won't explain it. I'll just read it. Um, again, um, historical characters are always appearing in my work, other poets, other musicians, um, every so often a revolutionary. And in this one, um, I have a particular empathy for Toulouse Lautrec, and I've dreamt about him a few, of a few times. I love his art and have a great sense of, sense of empathy for who he was and what he did. Okay, sex was astronomical. Sex was everything you needed it to be, to the point of dictation, and it was. The ceiling was a fountain, your nerves, either pelvis, bra straps or erotic ladders. Smoke had the taste of lobster and Caribbean habanero. When you came, you came with everything, everything else, nose hair, everything, toe flakes, the heel of your socks, Moses in the reeds, the memory of ivory soap both pinkies. We juggled around with the main position, the last time around first and the other way, the position she favored. I was her dog. I had my own positions. Sometimes I was alone. She could really wait you out longer than you thought waiting was possible, dwelling there till you're banned. A spree without the spree, no spree to go on. Then what? Our routine was to meet and swim at the Marina Bathuria, get takeout food from the Takuria, then bring it back to the Fakuria. What did the suffix ia mean? Always adding something, that's the Fixiana and the Celebritania. When my truck broke down, I took a shortcut through La Brea tar pits to get the bus to meet her. That tar pit park, I was there in another era part of a crowd to see a fight I was going to witness, what I called an execution or an attempt at one. 
I ended up behind the prehistoric observation pit, smoking weed. Some stayed in their cars on top of their girlfriends. That's what they said. It was all dirty lettuce, saber tooth oil, bits of fossilized sloth beard in the sand bank, smog five times the poison of industrial Denver. My lungs stayed a couple of songs too long. My atmospheric barometer was off, not the erosion, never that. The erodometer never jammed. Love and destruction was in incidental. Denver is incidental. The organs backpedaling under the constellation of mice visible three, maybe four times a year. The last time around first and enough left now to do what for how long? Remodeling and termite repairs going on at the front entrance. I, a few times I had to climb over the construction materials and scaffolding through her window. Me and Toulouse Lautrec, my version, the two of us. Toulouse had painted his throat. He thought he painted it open. He wanted to say what it felt like, how it singed him to himself after it singed him to her. Those words wouldn't come out. How much sympathy did I need? One thing that stood out on the windowsill shelf of Susie Bleakie's apartment, that toy cow with metal or aluminum covered hoofs. It could have been something sold cheap in Tijuana. The on switch was broken. There were horse or cowhide pads on the hooves under the forelegs and Venus of Monroos shaped hindquarters curved to make a grinding motion, smooth down what lies under her or behind her. Then I heard a drawer opening. I woke up. There's a rhythm in the drawer pull in her hand that woke me. I would know who's making that sound anywhere. How did that purple finch's nest fit between stucco and the downspout bend and the moss on the last rafter tail? Fascia board, another width, after alert, sleek, peeping finch head at her window, seeing it, me and Toulouse Lautrec, the melancholic alphabet, her fleshy ankle, the rest of it regretful, semi-accountable, not as dismissible as you used to think. <laughs> Thank you, Darn. That's great. Where where can people get your new book? Uh, you can order it from, uh, I guess you can get it at Amazon or High Moon Noon Books or at my own website. I'm at DoranRobbinsWordPress.com. It's a new website that was just uh, completed. Or at uh, the publisher is High Moon Noon Books. And that's high like high. And then moon, O-O-N. So he kind of blends the two words together. High Moon Noon. Great, great. Sharon, where can uh, we uh, get your book? Uh, my book is uh, "Will There." <laughs> my book is "Will There Be Music," and it's available on Amazon. Uh, you can get it from your any independent bookstore. Just order it. You know the Cherry Grove Collections has it all in the system. Right. Yeah. Yes, you can order bookstores too. You forget because I haven't been out to a bookstore in three months. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and as we speak. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Sharon. Thank, thank you, Doran, so much for participating. And uh, you know, Sharon, it's um, what is it? It's eleven ten. That's okay. You're I'm good. Still... Okay, great. <laughs> you're in New York time. Yeah. Um, thanks for sticking around. Uh, we have the open mic uh, coming up now. Uh, go ahead, folks. Um, type your name in if you want to join us on the open mic. Um, it's one poem. It's five minutes. Uh, uh, nothing racist. Uh, no, no, no images of bombs. Uh, you know, uh, nothing. No nudity. Thing like that. Um, you know, just like in any uh, well-read open mic, uh, we're pretty open. But um, yeah, so. So visit the bar, and um, and we've got we've got free food, whatever you've got in the fridge. You know, <laughs> That's right. That's totally right. like yeah, totally free, and uh, and and grab your wine and uh, um, yeah, 
and and donate donate one dollar on Square each to Works and and PCSJ. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We have uh, the cheese. We have the crackers, pineapple. Um, I'm looking at uh, the chat room now as people are um, are uh, signing in and. Um, uh, remember also that we have the um, San Jose Poetry Slam. Uh, you know that's that's still in town, and uh, that will uh, begin uh, activity as soon as uh, as we can have participants enter uh, Caravan Lounge. So stay tuned uh, for that. And then uh, next month at uh, Well Read, we're going to have Janine UC featured along with um, uh, Sacramento Poet Laureate Emerita, Emeritus Indigo Moore, who is now also residing, I think, in New Jersey. So we're going to continue on this uh, West Coast, East Coast uh, jaunt. Um, so I've got now, uh, <clears throat> if you have any questions for me, uh, let me know. Uh, I have Bill will read. Uh huh. Okay. And um, we also have Larry Hollis. Okay. And Elizabeth. Okay. And uh, then we have Quamel. Uh, I hope uh, Low Angeles for open mic. Uh, let me know. Uh, how to pronounce your name. If I mispronounce it, please uh, correct me, okay? Um, don't let me uh, go without the correction. Uh, Mary Marsha. Uh, and then we have uh, Janine UC, okay? Uh, and uh, we have um, Scorp, Scorpiana, who is our slam master for the San Jose Poetry Slam. Uh, of course, Pushpa, Pushpa coming up. And finally, let's see. Okay, Maggie Diamond. Oh, this is a big list now. Okay, Maggie Diamond. And um, let's see. Stephanie. Okay. And finally, let's see, Manny. Thanks, Manny. And uh, thank you, Deborah. Yes. Okay. And uh, of course, Masuma, you can read. Uh, let me know how to pronounce your name and when we get to you. Thank you so much. Um, and bringing up, yes, br sending us home, Brandon Lou. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, Hope um, Brandon uh, was finishing his MFA in May, and uh, hope everything is okay. All right, um, I'm gonna cancel the spotlight video, and uh, we uh, Bill Cazzini. Yes, okay, Bill will be. Yeah, okay, got that. Funny. <laughs> All right. Now, starting the open mic, um, you know, uh, if, uh, if I missed you, um, put it on the chat room and I will get, I will get to you. So usually we'll have um, somebody doing admin functions in the background, um, but I'm, I'll be doing that as well. Okay, so please now welcome to the mic our treasurer and editor in chief, Bill Cazzini. Go ahead, Bill, come on up. Uh, Dora and Sharon, those are great readings. I, I really enjoyed everything you guys read. I, I found that I like blocking out my video because I can walk around the room and I hear a good line, I can fist pump. And then I'm not like distracting the screen. I feel less self-conscious. So um, great readings. Thank you very much. Um, 
I'm up in my mom's mobile home. My mom, uh, a year and a half ago, had a stroke. She's now in a wonderful uh, facility that is can actually help her uh, grow. Where my sister and I were, my sister was just with me. We're selling all of the possessions in her mobile home. Um, we're selling her mobile home. We have a contract, kind of an, actually a really positive, good little week to get that stuff moving forward. And after taking my sister to the airport to help with some shipping, I came back home. I started reading the haiku that people submitted. And one of those haiku just immediately struck me. I wrote this poem that I'm going to read now. It's roughly titled The Curse That We Ask For. Um, the curse that we ask for. So here we are at the Sacramento airport, the side road shipping stations. Linda packed the cedar chest that great Aunt Helen passed to mom, Wisconsin to California. That mom surrenders post stroke. All of the children know the scent, but Linda adored. Now a box on a scale to ship to Alaska. Linda guesses the weight to the pound. Good ending. Thank you, Bill. Now, uh, please welcome to the mic, Larry Hollis. Larry, unmute yourself. If there we uh, go. There we go. Good. Oh, yeah. All right. Um, thank you both for the reading. Um, I'm glad Allen Ginsberg was mentioned. This poem I wrote today is, is influenced by Allen Ginsberg. It's called Hum Wall, H U M Wall. Hum Wall from Allen Ginsberg. Hum Bid Wall, Mexico Build Wall. Hum Bid Wall, Mexico Build Wall. Hum Bid Wall, Mexico Build Wall. Who Bid Wall, I Bid Wall. Whom build wall, I build wall. Whom build wall, I build wall. Well, where build wall? On the border. Where build wall? On the border. Where build wall? On the border. Where build wall? Around my house. Where build wall? Around my house. Where build wall? Around the wall. House. Whose wall? My wall. Whose wall? My wall. Whose wall? My wall. Whose wall? Our wall. Whose wall? Our wall. Whose wall? Our wall. Whose wall? Black Lives Matter wall. Whose lives? Whose wall? Black Lives Matter wall. Who lot? Who's wall? Black Lives Matter wall. Who's, where's wall? Black Lives Matter ab. Where's wall? Black Lives Matter's ab. Where's wall? Black Lives Matter ab. What lives matter? Black lives. What lives matter? Black lives. What lives matter? Black lives. Thank you, Larry. Thank you so much for the poem. Next up. Please welcome Elizabeth Jimenez Montelongo. Hi, Elizabeth. Oh, let's let's get you unmuted here. Okay, try and oh, there we go. Okay, I hit unmute and I'm still always muted. <laughs> Sorry. Anyways, I was typing in the chat box. So thank you, Larry. Um, so I want to read these two poems, um, I just wrote recently. Um, all right. When a giant awakens, when our sun is at its throne, when the drought starts to drown and the winds are sharp, melt the remains of your emperor's golden crown, make a golden arrow to shoot into the heart of the gold-sucking vampire. And when the moon is full, the wolves and turkeys howl together as one, and the obsidian mirrors. Tell the truth. Shut your eyes. Look closely. Keep your hands where we can see them. Clasp in other hands. Don't let the right one see where the left one is. Leave your old skins behind to dry in the sun. Emerging back into the world from an introspective rest. Blow a song into the wind in harmony with another voice. Let the echo condense into thunder clouds. The lightning bolts burn, but the precipitation cleanses and soothes. Make our hands clean. And when the clouds reveal the sun, the glow from above equals the one from below. Nourishes what grows in between. That plant, 
the one with the white flowers, the one that grew over bones, the one with all the red fruit. The fruit is for everyone. Go on, take a bite. So that is one, thanks for listening. And I have another one. Um, these are really recent. Um, so they're in like a draft form. So hopefully I can read it properly. Um, this is kind of, this one's a little longer in um, mixed language. I, that goes the lingua you force fed me, and now I can waggle my double-edged tongue right back, a flinty, sparky weapon, electric currents right into my pen, writing to you words held in for 500 years, from the genes in my blood to the genes that spill my blood. Y aquí en este banquete de tacos y lenguas, y tacos de lengua, una gran reunión de pedernal fuego, sangre y historia. Here I speak words that burn, that spark fires that spread, Fires that burn, bonfires, fires that burn out, fires that leave ashes, ashes to cover my body in, ashes to weep in, creating rivers of ink that tattoo the body, that tattoo the soul, ashes to fertilize the roots, and ashes where roots find other roots, roots that move, roots that shake, roots that rattle the ground, a ground of ashes under which lie bones, bones that won't lie still. I saw them rise and connect. I saw the skeleton come together. Dancing skeleton, dancing with the corn plant, madre maiz, and neither had roots. Holding hands, no triangle, a circle. Cycling, spinning up into the air. Chose to stay here, return to earth, feet on the ground, roots in the earth, roots in the ashes, on the bones that won't lie still. Rising from the ashes, rise from the ashes. I rose from the ashes. Ashes to ashes, ashes on my forehead, ashes in a cross. A cross burned to ashes, they painted it on my nopal. And I'm going to strike that lengua on another. Ay, cachista. Ashes, ashes, but I refuse to fall down, even when I'm six feet underground. And mira como le hago. I'm a lengua that you label me with. I am my thoughts that I nodded to. I am the palabras you all shoved in my mouth. But I spit them out in a different order, and I order them to emerge. Spill in chispas. Run in ashes and tears. And from there, where my two brown feet are planted, rises a quetzali phoenix with a long coiled body that rises into the air, feathers, maize, and white flowers, que llueva, into rivers and lakes and underground, into oceans and humidity, bits of lagrimas to lagrimas, tears to tears, que llueva, and may the plants grow tall. All right, that's the end of it. Thank you for listening. Yeah. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much uh, for the poem, for the poems uh, and sharing in both in, in both languages. Now, uh, please welcome to the mic, uh, Guamel from Los Angeles. Oh, sorry, yeah, I, I misspell. You know, trying to type real fast. I'm Guamel. I'm from Los Angeles. Guamel from Los Angeles. <laughs> Welcome to the mic. Thank you so much for joining the community here. Indeed, I uh, yeah, it was invited by a friend. Uh, she could reveal herself. Um, yeah, and I'm here to let you know what I do um, in the in the darkness to uh, keep from embarrassing myself. So, this is from the book from my book, Peace in the Pocket, available on World Stage Press. This is called "The Lady Is My Shepherd." Check it out. I must express these words while I am bubbling. Whether next to or away from you, the feelings are doubling. My head is juggling. Spheres of possibilities colliding in a 3D Venn diagram. From Jump, from jump Street, every neat new deep I learned about you made me say, damn, she's so complete. Ain't no trick. This all here treat, baby. What a great feat it would be to, circumnav to circumnavigate your globes. I want to explore you more. I want to know every square inch of you, my earth, and I choose for myself the best part, my heart. Let me ask you a question for review. Ever meet someone that makes you reevaluate? Ever meet someone that makes you want to renew your history? Scale it a year to every mile. Every mile we walk together a comprehensive course in each other, a, re a relay willing the torch of deep lovers, yielding to the surface things were once kept under deep cover, things you felt no comfort blessing upon others. Now you can unpack those boxes. Now you're safe at home. Now you're no longer alone. Ever meet someone that makes you feel that way on each date? I felt I did not want to smother thee. 
you felt you did not want to mother me. I said, why not wife me instead? I'd happily accept that position until I'm dead, doing what I love, never needing to retire, a battery in my back constantly recharged, your every mood, a new food I taste post haste, mouth watering at its every note of spice. I stay hungry for the way you season my life, suffering withdrawal from your medicine, getting my fix on contact. Nobody dare intervene as I refuse to go clean. You are a high concept woman, an all season blockbuster woman. Screw the critics, shut up and take my money, I'm with it. I'm on board for this trip, gots to have my ticket. If the engine breaks down, I'm stranded in contentment. In the heat, even in the cold, absolute zero resentment. You know why I say you capture my imagination? The same reason I haven't you try is my patience. The same reason I stay playing the bar case song, Anticipation. You have my fascination fixated. My lady, you are the shepherd for whom I waited. I hope that's not too much undue pressure. Insert sheepish smiley face emoji. You're just a once in a lifetime love. Think the Lakers time and the prime of Kobe. Milestones, marvelous in degree and number. Keeps the crime rising, keeps the cream rising, I should say, in wet dreams every slumber. Excuse a civilized man for speaking so savagely. I must cover each base when you hit homers that leave me ravaged, see? Baby, baby, you for show, for show ain't the average. Your nuclear potential is on a level quite presidential. Your every element is a basic essential. The end. <laughs> you gotta have some claps and, and, and clicks. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing. <laughs> I'll do better next time. Trust and, me. It's great, great. Uh, join us next month uh, from Los Angeles again, okay? Yes, indeed. Thank you, sir. Next up, uh, we've got Mary Marsha Cassily. Where, let me get you up here, Mary Marsha, just a second. Uh, okay, here we go, Mary. And... Uh, Okay. Where are you? Um, you can't see me. You and the reason, the reason is because there has been a glitch with the upgrade of Zoom that it, it just, it, my camera won't work. Some, I have to quit and come back. Okay? So we'll just do a little poem. Okay? Is that all right? You you got it. That's okay. okay. I'm don't, sorry don't you can't. Away. Cool. Yeah, sure. All go right, ahead. I'm gonna go. This is from a, a longer poem, Twilight Refuge, but this is for Sharon and Doran. Um, okay. Where can we lose ourselves? Where can we find the titles of all those books? The library is closed. But I love the entrance of night bluebirds that at night add and subtract volumes. That's it. Thank you. Thank Sorry you, Mary that. Marcia. <laughs> Join us again next month, okay? Now, coming up, our next month's feature with Indigo Moore, Janine UC. Come on up, Janine. Where are you here? Uh, there you go. All right. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. So, I a short poem and then an even shorter poem. Yeah. All right. Fear of causing damage keeps us quiet. Listen to the silent ones. We know how much hurt resides in words. And then another poem. The sparkle in her eyes lost to her since the sparks flew. Sizzle of electrical fire still burns inside her. Back home with her pastel plates, pink and yellow, blue and green, 
Place settings for eight passed into granddaughter's anxious hands. Saucers fly through space, bowls drop and roll, bright white clay beneath the glaze. Granddaughter collects their shards in a clear glass jar. These puzzle pieces form a mosaic made from past particles, a gift of the present, any family's future. Thank you, Janine. You're welcome. Thank you for sharing those poems and looking forward to your feature next month. Yeah, do me too. <laughs> okay. Now, please welcome to the mic our Slam Master Scorpiana. Excellent. Where are you, Scorpiana? Um, there I am. I gotcha. All right. Sorry, I've had like a really bad cough all week. I swear it's not Corona. I'm just a smoker. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been writing COVID poems. Ring around the COVID, a pocket full of panic. Face mask, face mask, we all fall down. I get emails from companies that I once traded precious dollars for slices of fashion. They make up for lost dollars trying to sell me designer face masks in every pattern and color. I wonder if the lace trimmed leopard print one will match my disposable gloves. I wonder if next month Forever 21 will have the latest in hazmat suits. Paranoid, I'm now the neighborhood quarantinista modeling the latest crossbody bag with the rhinestone holster for my bottle of hand sanitizer. It's better than modeling the latest body bag, and I strip my stuff down supermarket runways, the epitome of pandemic chic, as I ring around the COVID a pocket full of duct tape, fashion, fashion, until I fall down dead. That's it. Um, so Sunday night, I haven't put up the Facebook invite yet. Um, the Slam's doing something on Zoom here. Um, it's gonna be a little more open mic um, and we're gonna be kind of doing a priority because I wanna give, um, I wanna give voices for like black voices in the community because we like, still right now we're still going through protest but at the same time i don't want to forget that it's pride month so um instead of an actual slam we are going to be doing an open mic and um priority sign up on the list i want everybody to come and watch but we are making priority for um black poets and queer poets um we're gonna have a feature and i'm totally blanking on the feature is that we have popping up. Um, last month's slam was really kind of slow. We only, it was our first time doing it on Zoom. Um, so we had like quite a few people come watch, but we only had two poets wanted to sign up. So we just kept going like head to head with the two poets, but it was like, it was a lot of fun. And, you know, until we can, um, you know, actually start meeting up again safely in public. Um, you know, glad we have like this platform to still keep doing stuff. Great, great. Well, great, great to hear that. And uh, people can um, get the info from the San Jose Slams Facebook page, right? Yeah, I haven't posted it yet, but. Um, great. All right. You heard it, folks. Thanks again. Thanks, Scorp. Now, please welcome to the mic, Maggie Diamond. Come on up, Maggie. Where are you? Uh, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. All right. I wrote this in February, but it seems so... Um, well, yeah, <clears throat> moment. Will we have a day, a moment 
to point to when the end finally arrived. A Wednesday afternoon in the Senate, a Thursday night in Parliament, a Tuesday night in November, or was it September, or 1984, or before? Rome didn't fall in a day. If it hadn't been the Visigoths, it would have ended some other way. The slow-moving coup already in motion, if it hadn't been the orange menace, it would have been some other notion. We who have marched, boarded buses for DC before dawn, carried our handmade signs, stood against threats, tear gas, and arrests. We have occupied, sat in, stood shoulder to shoulder in the rain, held vigil, acted up, knitted hats, sung songs of peace and solidarity and overcoming. But it turns out we are overcome with bills to pay, masters to serve. Perhaps we get what we deserve. The slow death of dreams deferred, justice denied. For so many, we've lost count or lost hope. Will we have a day, a moment to point to when the resistance took shape at last? When the youth picked up the baton as a stake and plunged it into the machine's corrupt heart? Black lives, yellow vests, the climate march, Hong Kong protests, some other movement yet to start. The world won't be healed in a day or a lifetime. But if humanity is here to stay, things will have to change and the moment is now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for that poem. Thank you. Now, please welcome to the mic, Stephanie Pressman. Stephanie, come on up to the mic. All right. I want to see everybody else. <laughs> I wrote this poem just after um, George Floyd, uh, the announcement of George Floyd, and there was a um, an article about Kaepernick and whom I had supported all along. And I'm a big fo football fan anyway, but I but I really appreciated that he, his thoughtfulness and in his protests. And um, I find myself weeping a lot lately, um, weeping about the good the, the kindnesses that people do but also all the the horrors that we're facing in the in the last few weeks so i wrote this call and and there was somebody who said we don't broadcast our outrage often enough so i wrote i broadcast my outrage oh mary don't you weep don't you mourn no oh, mary don't you weep don't you mourn pharaoh's armies are drowned oh mary don't you weep my san jose neighbors set cars on fire burst from shelter where helpless to stop the knee from another black man's neck they weep oh mothers weep more and mourn with Kepernick, I take a knee. Dear sisters, we cannot stand so much mourning. Pharaoh's armies are risen, tear gas, gunfire. We only thought they drowned. So weep at their resurrection. No loved ones saved, all mourned for. On the football field, the streets of fire in Minnesota, where no one falls on their knees, bent to a just God, but spits anger at injustice weeps at bad choices along the way, who to kneel with or stand with, who to blame for fires blazing in the gut. Hundreds of families weep for their lost ones daily. Fathers mourn their sons, brothers, uncles, grandmothers weep. Ahmad, Breonna, George, Trayvon mourned as we did at hanging trees, church fires, Oh, martyrs, I am with you on my knees. Then I rise, broadcast my outrage, fire up these weapons I have, old woman weeping that I can't protect us, reading each morning of another and another, one more policeman's knee.
Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you so much for that poem. Greatly appreciate that. Now, please welcome to the mic, Manny. Hello. Uh, there you go. Yeah, I can, can hear you now. Yep. All right. Um, yeah, Thanks it's just some that. new shit I wrote that no one will probably get, but um, here we go. Uh, note to self, get off your phone and write. Write your future, write the past, let now be the game changer. Level up, let now be all that you are, let now be everything that you ever thought you could be, let now be your best life. Let now be fresh breath, breathe and stop. We are one in a tribe on this quest of love. We imagine a brighter tomorrow. Our children are counting on us. The buck has stopped here as I restore all harmony. I am the new civilization. I end all karma, uh, all karma violet flame style. Transmute everyone's government name back to I am. Because I am whatever you say I am. May love be the call I answer to when you call me or any one of my tribe. I am one love. I am one love. I am one love. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you, Manny. Thank you for sharing tonight. Now, please welcome to the mic, Deborah Kennedy. Deborah, come on up. Are you there? I am right here. Oh, great. Okay. Gotcha. All right. What a wonderful evening. Thanks so much to Sharon and Doran and Rob for setting this up. And it's great to see everybody and hear your work. I uh, wrote a poem called Living in the Time of Zombies last year. And it was partially about pandemics, but I'm not going to read that one. I'm going to read one of my more hopeful poems, kind of, uh, called Banked Fire. Banked fire. This golden moment, a drop of honey, limpid light. Amber flows in my veins, pollen fills my lungs. The air so still, a white feather drops straight down. All futures are possible, but some are more likely. New oak leaves radiant and warm afternoon rays, tender, splendid, glossy life lights up the entire sky. Weather vanes turn, seven helicopters beat above. Believe in the best new day you can. Jenny told us the abuse of power should come as no surprise. Few who grip the grinding levers know what else they could do. Burn for another sun, another golden moment. Walk on a banked fire smoldering in your heart. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing tonight. Now, please welcome to the mic, Masuma Ahmed. Masuma, did I say your name correctly? Yes. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to read, um, I wrote it a few years ago. So it was relevant for uh, immigrants and the wall built and the immigrants in Europe um, coming from Syria, Libya, and Rohingyas. So, uh, the poetic travesty. What is a poem anyway? A bunch of words put together? 
to tear the soul apart in a fancy way, to ooze the blood boiled on a plate when I could not leave home, to console me because you are no longer here, to stop me from crying. You are dead. The bullet perforated your heart as you were crossing the road for a few pieces of stale bread. Salty tears cannot tell lies. Shells were everywhere, mocking lives as we stepped on them. Baby could not get the milk. My breasts were dry. The ocean was a beast I and my child could not cross. The dinghy was too small to carry us along on the other side. I traded the pink dress molested with semen. Valentine's stories cupped in red roses with venoms floated everywhere. The snake dance crossing the border stabbed my child's back. I called them killer drones as they flew overhead. I ran on the open field covered with live mines. There was no way, to, nowhere to go. What is life? A throbbing heart? An imbecile brain sold for an ID card? A naked body bought as a woman when I'm nobody's daughter, wife, or a mother? Clothed in flesh with a vagina? The exchange rate was too high for a green pepper, paper. I'm a refugee, a migrant with calloused hands, begging at your door for a pint of life. Can poetry buy me the freedom, the food, my dignity? Where can I feel safe? Thank you. Thank you, Masuma. Now, concluding the evening and sending us home tonight, please welcome to the mic, Brandon, Lou, Brandon, come on up to the mic. So much good poetry tonight. Uh, I have one poem to read, and this one was written thanks in part to um, Elizabeth and all the po poets from the reading parking lot poets, which I attended a few weeks ago. Untitled first draft. I think it could still use some work, but I want to read it. Anger, so much anger. What do we do with it all when we can no longer hold it back? When we feel so much for what hurts us, for what hurts others, for what hurts the lies of those that can no longer go on, the lies of those that cannot hurt anymore. A neck can snap like splintered wood under a heavy boot, but the trees of the forest only grow thicker. We can echo our hate for years, let it come down like an avalanche in a desolate valley, but it does not nourish our young, it buries them. We can let hate burn inside us until we are burning homes and cars and inhaling the fumes of the fallen, and we are burning ourselves the way fire feeds on itself. We can throw bats at windows, watch them break glass like bullets break bones. Refract, refrain, how can we abstain from this pain? I have a crosshair steadied on my target, but I am not aiming for a head. I am aiming for a heart to change. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Brandon. Thank you so much for sending us home with that poem. Greatly appreciate it. And thank you to Doran. Thank you to Sharon. Thank you to all of the open mic readers. And um, Next month, join us with Janine UC at the mic and Indigo Moore, uh, who was a uh, Sacramento Poet Laureate and at one time uh, president of Sacramento Poetry Center. 
And thank you all for taking risks uh, for the truth out there and for your prayers. And I'm going to unmute everybody. And before I do that, in the words of Flamel, I want you to all go out there and, sit and remember his words. Never diss your own words before others hear them. Thank you, Flamel. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't want to mute all. I want to unmute people. How do I unmute everybody? Thank you, Kwamel. Important that you said that. Yeah, I got that from the very first workshop I heard when I entered poetry. So that, that it was important to everybody, everybody else, you know, uh, resonate with that. We had a we had a word for that at Waverly Writers. No disclaimers. Yeah, that's that's what they used to say. I just had to kind of give it a, give it a remix for the moment. <laughs> Appreciate yeah. it. Well, it's, it's, it's really wonderful. Just unmuting everybody now to have everybody, you know, give embraces. So good. Give some, <laughs> give some love to one another. That was awesome. <laughs> one of my favorite poets uh, says, "Sigo en la sombra, lleno de luz. I go in the dark, lit from within." Wow. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth, for the invite, and I can't wait to return to the Bay at some point. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for coming. Nice to be here with everybody. I posted in the chat, actually, while I'm talking. I posted in the chat if you guys want to join um, um what's it called? Empowerment Poetry by People of Color. Um, it's a new Facebook group. Everybody's welcome. Um, and then there's Poets and Allies for Resistance. It's another um, poetry group. And it's really cool. I just joined it recently. Um, so they have readings too. Poets and Allies for Resistance. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Sharon, thank you for the poem with San Eustokia. I have a great story about that, but it's a little long for the situation. I don't know how we could hook up. I think you'd enjoy it, though. <laughs> Which poem? San Eustokia. Oh. Stand you still okay? <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe we can hook up somehow. I'm not sure. And remember, uh, Sejur is still taking submissions. We got a few more Open days. Our mind. Open our mind. We need your poem. <laughs> All right. And uh, to John and Desiree, thanks for joining us too. Uh, and Amy. Oh, yeah. All right. And be safe out there and sending you love. Take care, everybody. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Good, everyone. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Stay safe. Frank and truth. Bye. Follow on Instagram, Twitter. My name is Kwamel. Put it, on, uh, put it in the chat room, Kwamel. <laughs> For sure. Right now, and then uh, I'll uh, I'll uh, send it out on Facebook. Indeed, got it. Thank you. All right, folks. Hey, Rob. Um, it, it would be really great. I have this great poem about San. U I'm not a poem, but a great story about San Eustokia, which uh, I was talking about. You know, maybe uh, ask her if. Uh, you could share her, her email or something. I've, I've got to tell her the story, okay? It's so funny. <laughs> got it. You email me uh, what you want me to do, and uh, we'll get on it. Okay, that sounds good. Thanks so much for this wonderful evening. Thank you. Uh, oh, thanks, Masuma. I got it. Okay. Thanks, Kwamel. I got it. All right. All right, take it easy, everybody. Thank you so much, all. Be well. Thank you. Thank you.